don't know. I will begin the tutorial in a moment and explain a couple of sexual strategies that I perform. I'd say that the good part about it is that most strategies you can sort of carry on to different games. There are a lot of strategies in games that you can, like in sports, you can carry on to others. You don't mimic them, but you can sort of use the same ideas, which I think is pretty helpful. But it depends. Everyone's different, you know? It's going to have to do this weird countdown and then reboot. When people play the game, they're not, they don't play like this. You know, they're not going to be looking at the sky permanently to find a helicopter. So, all I have to do is just make sure I land the first burst of miniguns on my target, and they have zero time to react to it. So on their screen, it's just dead. Straight away. That's what it comes across on their end. But it's because I make sure I'm lined up before I actually fire. If I'm going to be, like, if I'm going to do it like this, say there's this tree here as the infantry player. If I do it like this... Okay. I'm an AA player, I always look at the skies. Yeah, oh, we'll get to the AA part, but... As an example, if, I'm, if there's a tree here and I kill... This is how I kill them. Okay. If you do that, you're going to give them all the time in the world to react to you. They're going to have a lot of time to make a reaction of some kind. And your aimer cannot move as fast as they move in some situations. So they're going to be doing a lot of AD-80 strafing and then you're going to end up committing, wondering, why can't I kill him? Why can't I kill him? And you're just going to crash and die. Okay? So... One important strategy that I like to do with a little bird, especially with the miniguns, I make sure I always l try to land my first shots on my target. Because the time to kill of the miniguns is ridiculous. On 60 hertz, it's pretty much under a second. It's probably... 100 milliseconds, maybe a little bit less to kill a player with the miniguns. Range is a big... like, there's damage drop-off, but at this range, it's literally like, he's dead. He's dead, straight away. Shaka, I'm doing a tutorial here, shut up. Anyway, the, um... What I used to do when I started flying the little bird was I would join... Not at the moment, Mazer, but soon. I would join uh, an empty map, either Test Range or Zavod. I liked Zavod, but uh, you can do Test Range as well. And I would just make, I would just shoot each tree and make sure that I would only fire when all my when my crosshair is perfectly on target. So pretty much what I'm doing now, I j and I d and keep in mind I started off slow. Okay, I was like this slow when I first started. Okay, now I've, I've done it for so long, I can just do it really quickly, right? And you get used to it, the more you do it. Right, so I, I did that, and that's how I improved my aim. The second way I improved my aim was 1v1-ing other pilots. This encourages you to improve your tracking. So as a maze, do you mind just moving like, a, like an idiot for no reason? Okay, so keeping the crosshair constantly focused on him is pretty much what tracking is, especially in the little bird. And... With tracking, that, that, that's how I improved my aim. I just versed other pilots, played pubs, and practiced flicking between t trees and making sure I'm accurate with each shot. When it comes to aiming, I did that. That's how I practiced, and that's how I got my little bird. The best way to aim the little bird, left and right, with your mouse and rolling, is to just very, very lightly tap A and D. So if the tree's over there, look how lightly I'm tapping it. Really, really lightly. You can see on my keyboard overlay, I'm not holding down A and D. I'm just tapping it. And another thing that I that I do is I let the glide of the heli assist me. So it, it's like it's like all vehicles have this weird built-in acceleration. So if I press A, I let go, it still keeps spinning for a few seconds. So I hold A. Let go now, it still keeps spinning. I sort of use that to my advantage. So, I press A, let go, it glides me towards the target. One thing that sensitivity does do, like vehicle sense, is it controls how sensitive this is. The, the rolling. The looking and the rolling. It controls that. It doesn't control the turning or the up and down, but it does control the mouse. Anything with the mouse, sensitivity will contribute to that. 
me personally, and this is this is why I say to a lot of people um, that sensitivity doesn't matter. So a lot of people put a big thing on it, like it's muscle memory, you know, like um, you got to stick to one, and if you change it, you're going to lose your aim. Yes, muscle memory is a thing. Yes, it exists. Yes, you can learn something, but your mind has the ability to adapt very fast, more, more like more fast than you think you can. So, you technically can learn and practice any sensitivity, but it's I reckon it's better to stick to one that you're comfortable with. But you can change. It's not going to ruin your aim. You know, it's not going to like that's it. Your aim's gone. Anything anything I've practiced for you is just gone. It doesn't work like that. But in my opinion, you should just use whatever feels comfortable. You shouldn't copy anybody. Copying people is a waste of time. It won't give you better aim. Just use whatever feels right and just... That's it. Uh, it's just practice after that. That's all it is. So you don't need to change anything. There's no point. Because ultimately, your mind will adapt and learn anyway. So, yeah, that's my take on sense. So, um... Yeah, so that pretty much covered aim, in a nutshell. The, uh... Yeah, that's that's how I aim. Something to keep in mind that um, I sort of learnt this over time watching a lot of other scout pilots is your momentum can take a really big impact on the way you aim. Like, what I mean by that is, like the best way to explain this is, um, if I'm flying fast, okay, so I'm building up momentum. I'm flying as this is as fast as a little bird can fly, okay. Right. If you're flying at this speed. It's going to be harder to aim, because if I try to turn while flying at this speed, the momentum of the speed is carrying my aim forward, because remember, movement is also aim, so it's sort of tied together. So whatever your momentum is will be the momentum of your aim. So you kind of have to be in a, in a way of flight where your aim has the most control. So what I, I, I tend to fly at this speed 90% of the time. Pay attention to how I'm flying. I'm leaned a little bit forward, right? I'm flying at around this speed. And no problem, moist shots have a good one, sir. This is the speed that I like to fly at, most of the time. The reason why is, this speed, you'll notice, if you're too slow, you'll struggle to... You can't use the momentum to aim. If you're too fast, you have too much momentum to aim. But if you're in the right speed, like around this much, you got the perfect momentum to quickly transfer between targets. It's it's the perfect momentum to be at, where you can swap and move and turn quickly. Similar to jets. Jets have 313. Scouts sort of have like an invisible 313. It's it's not the same, but you you get a feel for the there's a particular speed sweet spot where you have the best control over your aim compared to others. And you can just be fast at this momentum. You get used to it, so... Honestly, that covers up aim. That's the best thing I can give you on aim. Is just the biggest, most important tip on aim. Remember to lightly tap A and D. Don't hold it. Big mistake that everyone does is they hold it when they try to aim. Just lightly tap. Like you see on the keyboard overlay, I'm just tapping it. That's all you need to do when it comes to aiming. I am using my mouse but very lightly in most situations. I almost forgot one thing about aiming, I just remembered right now. The scout helicopter has has some spread. It has some spread growth. So if you notice, I don't know if you can notice this, the longer I fire it, the bigger the spread gets. It starts off really accurate, and then it grows a little bit. Just a little bit, not much. The further away you are from a target, the more you want to do bursts, and it'll be more accurate. So if I'm that far away, I'll probably burst this heli down, like that. But the closer they get, the less I need to burst. <laughs> the next thing I want to... The, the movement's not too complicated. Like, it's not. there's not much I can really explain about moving and flying. That just takes... you got to get used to it sort of thing. you just got to keep doing it until it gets easy. But one thing that I can help with is... Oh, very nice of you. I'm good at names. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Yes. But anyway, when it comes to the... If you want to get good at moving in the little bird, best thing I can tell you to do is find a building and fly through it. Do it on an empty server. 
fly under the bridge in test range. Just keep doing that until you don't crash, right? And just keep practicing it. You'll get a hang of being able to control your height and your momentum. And you'll get a feel of how big the little bird is and where it can go and where it can't go, right? So, uh, good e so just a quick tip for when it comes to flying through buildings, all right? Quick tip. If I'm moving forward, okay, if I'm gaining speed, the way you gain speed a little bit is you look down and you press up. So you're going up while you're leaning forward to gain speed, right? The problem with doing this is when you try to do it flying in a building, your tail is lifted up and it will hit the top of the roof like this. It'll do something like this. If you try to, you probably, when you fly, you probably run into that shit a lot. If you've tried that. You tend to crash a lot. And this is where something really useful that you can learn with flying the little bird. And that's, use your momentum to fit in places where the tail can't. So if I'm flying in here, I can. Right? I can, I can lean down. I've got all the flight room to do it. But how are you supposed to fly through this? With, if I'm going to look down... It won't work. So how do I do that? Well, you do that by using your own momentum. So, remember how I said earlier that if you you let go of all your keys, it sort of carries it out? So if I'm going forward and I let go, I move forward for a little bit more, you use that to go through places where you can't. So, this tiny gap here, I'm going to build up speed, then I'm going to straighten the little bird and let it glide itself through. Still gliding, still gliding. I, I didn't even... I didn't gain any more speed then. If you've got the room to gain speed, gain speed. But if you don't have the room, you have to lean forward a tiny bit, like gain a tiny bit of momentum like that, and let it glide itself through. So I'm gaining speed, then gliding again. Right? So... And the last thing I can give with movement is when you're turning, you have to learn to control your momentum. So... Like that, alright? So, all I'm doing is, as I'm flying... Can you stop, Mazer? Or is that dark? You fly forward, you stop, look up, to sort of control the momentum to back itself up, and then you turn gently. So, I'll do it now. But the thing is, you want to be ready for the turn. Yeah, and you guys are welcome to join if you like, as long as you just don't fucking interfere with the <laughs> tutorial. The, um, I know that there's a turn here, right? If I react to it too late, my momentum will carry me forward. So if I go through, it's like, oh, i got to turn now. My momentum's going to take me forward. I have to go back and go through. But if I'm ready for it, if I'm going to be back there, and I know that there's a turn coming and I want to turn, I'm going to preemptively prepare my momentum for it. Okay? So that's that's how I do that. And just using everything I said, if you've mastered those three things that I've said, you should be able to fly through A without bumping a single thing. And I'll do that now. As an example, keep 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 an eye, like remember what I said about how I control my momentum and gain little bits of speed. Watch how I do it in A. And I didn't bump anything. Stingers, once you understand them, are the easiest thing to deal with in the game. Okay? They might be annoying, but they're legitimately just a free kill. How do you deal with a stinger? Well, there's two ways. Alright, Mesa, start locking onto me. <laughs> okay. That's one way to deal with a stinger. You go behind a building or an object. There you go. You don't have to use your countermeasure, and the stinger is virtually useless. Now... The second way is you use your countermeasure. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Now... And you don't die while you're showing it. One of the most important ways to deal with your threats in a public match is something that everyone accuses everyone of doing in public games. You know what it is? It's the concept of time. They always ask me. They always, they, a lot of people would say to me, Reaper, you have, you have an infinite... You have an infinite ECM. How does your ECM just keep coming back? Well, it doesn't. I just I just time it. 
I make sure that I only ever go out there when it's ready. Right, so... Say I'm here out in the open. No cover. Right? I use my ECM. I'm gonna go hide. I'm taking too much heat. Now, under my ECM on the top left, it's got a timer. 10, 9, 8. I make sure that it's 0 before going out and killing the stinger. It's... Oh, the, the most powerful thing you can do is have timing, okay? So what do I know for a fact? When I activate the ECM, for 7 seconds, nothing can lock onto me. And I'm off the radar. So, I have 7 seconds to kill him. Alright? So say I'm back here. I said, don't fire a stinger just for a second, Mesa. Here's an example. Say I'm all the way back here. He's too far away to kill. So start locking onto me, Mesa. Alright, now, what you do, is he'll, if, he, if he was to fire it, okay, you do that, and then you push forward, alright, you go to the next source of cover, oh yeah, that's alright, that's alright, that's fine, you go to the next source of cover, he repeats, get closer, you try to get closer and closer and closer, then when you're close enough, you ECM, and you tell yourself in your mind, I've got exactly 7 seconds to kill him and get out of there, or to kill him and prepare for another source of cover. So, activated. One, two, three, four, killing infantry, five, six, seven. I'm now behind a new source of cover. That right there is how you, you're invincible to lock-ons. If you want to know how to be invincible to stingers, that's how you do it. It's that simple. You just have to time and preemptively prepare yourself for cover. That's all you have to do. It's so simple. See me? Okay, so now, I've got my ECM, I think, okay, I don't know where he is, I'll just go run and hide behind a rock, yeah? Alright, cool. He's still locking me, how the fuck is he doing this, is this guy cheating? Nope, he's just sitting at the ceiling. All you have to do is get out and repair. You will be out, you will be constantly out repeating his stingers, okay? And he can't beat you. Just have the mechanic perk, he can't beat you. And the other way is obviously just to be in the building. Now, he's out of stingers. Then once he gets low enough, which he is kind of now, fly up. If he's still got stingers, ECM, and kill him. That's, that's how you deal with it. That's how you deal with uh, stingers in the sky. Or you just fly into a building where things are above you. They shoot up. They go from, say he's here on the tow launcher. The tow launcher can't lock onto targets. But it can if someone laser designates it. So if he fires it, it will go straight up, across, straight down. How do you counter this? Well, two ways. You take advantage of this by having a ceiling above you. And you can you can tell when it's a laser lock because it it takes longer. It goes like beep beep beep. You get a feel that you know it's a laser lock and not a stinger. So when I know that happens. And if I'm near cover, I'll make sure that I go where there's a roof above me and it can't get me. Even if it's like a tiny roof like this, it still can't get me. Or even if I time it perfectly and just quickly hug a building like this. Like that. It will chip the edge of the building and I can dodge it. Okay? Your ECM can block it, obviously. Say you can't block it and you're at 100 health. Alright? You'll go down to 10 health. And... It can, if you're less than 90 health, it will kill you instantly. So the way you counter it if you're 100 health is before it's about to hit, jump out. The reason why is the splash damage from the explosion... The splash damage from the explosion sometimes shoot you out of the little bird. It, so the, the splash damage of the actual laser lock is so explosive, it shoots you out of your own heli. So to avoid that, you just jump out before it lands and quickly repair the heli. And that's how you deal with laser lock-ons, okay? Iglers don't rely on ECM. Iglers travel faster and lock on faster than a stinger does. So it can be sometimes harder to react and ECM and counter a sting an igler. But if you preemptively ECM, you can you can counter stingers. Uh iglers, sorry. So, what's the best way to deal with them? Now, s'mores only have one thing that they can use. 
And that's prediction. Because they're a projectile, their bullets travel and take time. Okay, so fire a s'more. Can, can one of you guys fire a s'more at me? Okay. That took probably two seconds to get to me, alright? You can take advantage of this. So, when it comes to a s'more... What the, the advantage that a small player has is, on you, they predict where you're going to fly. If I'm flying in one direction, all they have to do is shoot ahead of me and make the shot connect, right? But if I'm flying still, at this range, all I have to do is duck. Or just move. They can't predict me. Okay? Because I'm not flying in a direction that's readable. I'm, I'm still. So how, this, how are you supposed to predict something that's not moving? That's how you counter s'mores. The closer you are, the less time you have to dodge them. The further away you are, the easier it is to dodge them. But that's how you dodge s'mores. There's no way you can beat... There's, there's no way a small player can beat this. The only way they can beat you is if they surprise you from a place that you're not expecting it. Or you get too close. So that's how you deal with s'mores, straight up. The best way to deal with s'mores is don't be predictable. Don't be a readable target, and you will not die to s'mores. If you're readable, you'll die. If you follow one path, like you're on a fixed arcade rail, you're gonna die. Like that. What about if you don't see it coming? Okay. Good players... Good players will make sure that you don't see it coming. That takes into the consideration that you need to simply practice being more aware. Look at the flags, look where they're gonna come from, look where they will come from. But pretty much in a nutshell, don't move predictably and be out of range. S'mores cannot kill you, if, if you just do that. Okay? And that same principle applies to a tow launcher as well. Okay? You do the same thing. If you're in a lab and someone's towing you, they kill you by predicting the shot and leading it. If you're not moving and then you move at the end, they, they can't react in time to change it. So, that's how you deal with it. I don't know which one's you. Alright, go throw your AI mine down. Alright. It always mobility hits you. So I, I lose my momentum and it fixes me in the momentum. So people can take advantage of this. So pretty much, if they drop an AA mine, you're stunned, you can't move, they kill you with a small. Right? Now... If you get surprised by an AA mine, the way you deal with it is as fast as you can, you move, okay? So as soon as you get hit, you like bend backwards and you will just just, just try to do whatever you can to get momentum and get out of there, okay? First thing you can do, you need to do. Second thing, if you know the AA mines are already there, it's easy. They've got a surprisingly long range and you have to, you if, if you're... If you're quick enough to react, you can use your countermeasure in time and block it, if you're fast. The closer it is, the less time you have to react. Like a s'more, okay? I know that there's a roof there, I know it's full of stingers, I know it's full of s'mores, and I know it's full of AA mines. So how do I counter this? I fly in, I ECM, I keep my distance because I know that they're small players, and I wipe them out one at a time. So, example. Five, six, seven. Back to cover, waiting for my ECM again. That's how you clear a roof. It's that, it's not hard. The aim part is hard. Right, so say you're aiming, and you can't kill them. You're just struggling to kill them. If it's been five seconds and you haven't killed them, run. Don't get greedy and commit. Because eventually you're going to have no ECM and you're fucked. So whatever you do, don't commit. If you can't kill somebody. It should take you no less than a second or two to kill one player. If it's any longer, leave. Best advice I can give. Okay, guys. So, how you deal with UCAVs? Now, the, the, the annoying thing about UCAVs, okay, is they are probably one of the most difficult things to counter. And the reason why is... I'll give you a couple of reasons why. One, their splash range is huge. Okay? The UCAV can blow up... Say I'm on the floor here. See that tree in front of me? It can blow up there and kill me. Kill me out of the heli. Its splash range is massive. 
So, the way you deal with a, 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 an, a, an, um, and another problem with the UCAV is you can't hear them coming. Well, you can, but it's very faint and very hard in the public match to hear them, unless they get very close. So the way you deal with UCAVs is, depending on the UCAV, this will be either more difficult or simple, okay? A good UCAV will wait when you're busy. So if I'm turned away, a good UCAV will fire now, all right? But then you've got to play on that. You've got to bait him into firing, okay? So what I'll do is, if I know I'm versing a good UCAV, I'll do a lot of this. On his screen, I'm looking forward, but on mine, I'm looking to the left. He doesn't know that, though. I'm using third person, and I'm seeing the roof. He doesn't know that, though. I know it, but I can still see the roof. I can still see the roof on my right, just. But they don't know that. I can. So you want to bait the UCAV. Now, UCAVs have a, a time threshold. I think they replenish once every 30 seconds or 40, okay? So you... 50 seconds. Thanks. Yeah. You take advantage of that, okay? So you know that once they fire a UCAV, you have 50 seconds to keep in mind that there's going to be another one. So remember that, okay? Or if you look in the kill fit and they've redeployed, it might be different. So in, in, in a nutshell, the deal with UCAVs is just similar to the way you'll deal with a tow, but the timing is more fragile. So let it get close, close enough where it doesn't have time to turn to your change. So let it get close so then you have the time to duck before it can turn into you. Because they travel slow, if you preemptively start moving, they can turn and follow you. But if you do it in the way that they don't have enough time to turn, you will always dodge it. So, hang on guys. Alright, go for it. That's pretty much how you deal with UCAVs, honestly. Another way you can deal with them is you can bait them into the wrong direction. So, Sparky, you fire one. Oh, I'm probably too close. Oh, you're reloading. Okay, okay. You shouldn't be too much longer. You can also fly up. You can, um... And you can just... You can just fly away naturally, as long as you time it right. It's all about timing. Yeah, yes. Yes, Sparky, go. And I move now. As long as you get the timing right, you calves can't kill you, okay? It's all about timing. That's it. You just gotta move the moment... Yeah, yeah, but... The thing is, if I if I move, if you if I let you get close enough, they don't have the time to predict. Okay, you got to play on the fact that they don't have the time to change the direction before you've already moved. It's all about getting that timing right. All right. So how do you deal with AAs? Number one rule about AAs. Okay, the number one rule. You cannot beat them in a one-on-one -on -one fight. It's just impossible. Okay. You physically do not have the damage capability of defeating an AA in one 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 on one fight. So when a guy joins your squad and says, Reaper, why aren't you using the scout Halley to kill the AA? I tend to call them an idiot. Alright, let's 1v1, Mazer, let's go. Can't. You just li even if I used cannons, you literally cannot beat an AA. It's not possible. The only thing you can do to an AA is avoid it. Use buildings. Use your map, make sure it's constantly spotted. You keep an eye on where it is at all times. So as I'm flying around, okay, do you mind just shooting, Mazer? Just randomly shooting? Uh, you'll see me do this a lot in my streams. Right? I open the map a lot, go third person, open the map a lot, go third person, yeah? Are you firing, Mazer? Okay. When I, when I play... Alright? My number one priority in every game is always the AA. But it depends on the skill of the AA as well. Alright? So, I always, one, make sure I know exactly where it is. I always make sure I know where the damn thing is. So I'll keep it spotted. I'll, I'll use the map like that. I know he's on C, okay? So I'll use my map as an advantage to that, okay? So the way you avoid it is pretty straightforward. If the AA goes north, you go south. If the AA goes east, you go west. If the AA is behind the building, you go on the other side of the building. If the AA is chasing you, you run away. 
If the AA is close, you go further. You literally just treat it like it's an invincible, invincible boss from a role-playing game. That's how you deal with AAs. Straight up, that's how you deal with AAs. How do you deal with the AA if there's vehicles surrounding and defending it? You're not supposed to deal with it. You're supposed to avoid it. You can deal with the vehicles surrounding it, but you're not supposed to deal with the AA itself. That's not your job. The only time you ever want to attack the AA is if it's being attacked by something else and it's not focused on you. But if it's just him alone and all he's got is just focusing on you, you cannot win. You have to avoid it. Now, another thing to keep in mind, okay? Three things to keep in mind. If an active raider, a passive raider, or a heat seeker is coming out of any vehicle in the game, if you fly 20 meters, under 20 meters from the ground, so look at, look at the radar, I think it's 20 or 25. Do you see the little um, number on next to my crosshair on the right? This is 28, 27, 23, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20. If you are under, I think it's 20 or 25, heat seekers and passives and actives cannot lock onto you. Okay? You cannot be locked on if you are under that threshold. Okay? If you are above that threshold, you can be locked on. So if there's a scout heli chasing you with heat seekers, fly underneath 20 meters to the ground, below radar, he can't shoot. Okay? Same with passives, same with actives. They can't. It is 100% based on the map. You're. You, It's too loud. It's too loud. I can't focus. When it comes to Jets versus Scouts, Jets... Scouts do more damage to Jets than Jets do to Scouts. But... If the ceiling is low, a good Jet Pilot will always win. If the ceiling is high, a good Scout Pilot will always win. But both of them can constantly nag each other forever. Okay? But ultimately, it's based on how high the ceiling is for the Scouts. If it's a tall ceiling map, the scout has the advantage. If it's a low ceiling map, the jet will always have the advantage. It is completely map based. It's not the case in Battlefield 3. In Battlefield 3, all air vehicles have the exact same ceilings. In 4, it's not like that. So, in a nutshell, map based. 100%. So, he's using passives, or actives in this video. Now what I do is I gain as much height as possible. I look up. Okay, I ECM when he fires his passive or actives, and it's with a Z11. I look up, straight up, okay, and he's dive bombing me from the top. I look up. I've only got a short amount of time before I hit the floor. I shoot at him. He starts to dive up, so I lead the shot so that I can land my bullets. He dies, and I've just, just got enough time before I hit the floor. A good jet pilot, well, he's not a bad jet pilot, he made a mistake, but what jet pilots will do is they will then fly back up before I had the time to do that. So it, realistically in that situation, I would have hit the floor and died and he would have flown away, okay? But on a tall ceiling map, I have more height to work with. That's how you deal with jet pilots, okay? What I just showed you, that's how you deal with jet pilots. Alright, settings. Settings real quick. There's not really much to go on to this, in the sense that it's just preference, okay? Don't copy mine, don't copy another pilot, just use whatever feels right, okay? Don't copy anybody. It's, there's, it's just, it's, there's no point. Copying someone's not going to give you their aim. Practice will. Two things I greatly encourage, okay? One, bump your vehicle field of view to the max. There is no negative benefit to doing this. It makes your third-person camera view way larger. Okay. It, just pressing third-person, I can see so much around me with my FOV this high. Okay? So, if you're a pilot, bump your vehicle field of view as high as you can. There's no negative benefit to it. There's no nothing to it. Okay? Put mesh on ultra. Why? Because in this game... In this game, your mesh is your view distance. So, the higher your mesh, the further away you can see people. That's what it is, in a nutshell. So, bump that up as max as you can. Put your vehicle field of view as high as you can. The rest is complete preference. Spotting icon size, 
screen adjustment size, everything's preference. But those two, I think are mandatory, personally. I think it should be definite. Did you show keybinds? My keybinds are the default. I already explained it, bro. All, that's, all that I changed is that this scroll button opens the big map. Everything else is completely default. I didn't change anything else. So let's talk about the loadout real quick. Now, miniguns or cannons? Miniguns are better. Okay? The best thing I can tell you, they're just better. They kill faster, they're more accurate, they have infinite ammo, they do way more damage to light armor. Cannons are only good for one thing in this game. And that's shooting out other enemy little bird pilots from their cockpit. No, there's nothing else worth using of that of the cannons. That's the only thing they're good for. Miniguns are better. There's nothing else to say about that. Okay? If you're good with your aim, you don't need heat seekers. If you're good with your positioning, you don't need heat seekers. So, as what's level left, laser guided are your best choice. Okay? Uh, flares or ECM jammer. ECM jammer gives you the opportunity to take more time. So you can fly in, 7 seconds, kill people, fly out. Fly in, 7 You can repeat that and keep farming. With flares, you can't necessarily do that. So ECM are my best choice, in my opinion. And last but not least... <sighs> you don't need any of these. Okay? You don't need air radar. You don't need proximity scan, stealth coding, or gyro stabilizer. Belt feed is only good because it lets you use one whole clip to kill a, a little bird pilot. That's the only reason. But you honestly don't need them. They're, they're not really needed. You, all you need is just belt feeder. That's all you need. So this is, this is my, in my opinion, the best little bird loadout in the game. Miniguns, laser guided, ECM, and belt feeder. You don't need anything else. That's the that's little bird loadout for you. Okay, so before we do a 1v1, I'm just going to quickly explain a couple of tricks to 1v1ing, okay? And how it works. 1v1ing is basically about dodging and tracking. Being able to keep your crosshair on target at all times, and while doing that, dodging. Okay? Dodging by up and down, maybe a bit of vertical, you know, while aiming. In a nutshell, whoever does that better wins, okay? But something to keep in mind is if you get the timing right with your mini guns, you can sort of prevent them from overheating. So I'll give you an example. Fire the mini guns for one, two, three, four, five. It's overheated, okay? If you do it like this, you can sort of take advantage of this. So just give me a sec. Okay. Yeah, in a nutshell, zero, it does. 100%. All of this does. All Everything I'm explaining does. This is just some helpful information. If you do this, you can sort of dodge the cooldown a little bit. One, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. You just keep doing that. In a 1v1, that can help you. And even with like targets like transports, where you can't end in one clip, it's helpful to do it like that. The further away you are, the more you always want to burst. So I'll do a 1v1 demonstration with Loopy. It says you're zero health. So you're you're in the you're in the decim you're you're in the decimals, bro. You're like point one. <laughs> Makes sense to me. I'll explain these extra things. So now these are little tips and tricks that you'll see me doing a lot. Okay. When the enemy spots you, if you do this, or this, you're unspotted, okay? So, where is this useful? If you're flying behind a building and you want to surprise them, you unspot yourself. Very good tactic, very good tip, works on every air vehicle in the game, recommended. And I think it works on ground vehicles too. So, unspot whenever you think you need to, you know? I wouldn't go fucking insane doing this 24-7, but... Whenever I feel like I need to surprise my enemy, I do it. And you can see me do it in public games quite a lot. You're reminding me of a lot of stuff, thank you. Switching seats or jumping out before you're about to land can reduce the damage. It takes less damage if you jump out and it lands. Or if you're about to land, you let it glide down, you take less damage. 
okay? Now, this is a very, like, skillful strategy, okay? And it's not really that ideal for most situations, but it's cool, okay? And what this is, is... So you're all aware of that, if you're in a seat on the side of a little bird, it, repa it repairs slower, okay? If you're out of it and you repair it, it repairs two times faster, right? It is possible to jump out of your own helicopter, land on it, and repair it, okay? And there's a way to do it. I'll show you how I do it now. Okay. Alright, and you can do that with every air vehicle. Jets are, are different, but... It's a cool thing you can do. You can sometimes s'more people from this as well. But then that happens, okay? You gotta be careful when smoring off a side heli, because you're you're in the hitbox and it can sometimes blow up the heli. Right. If I get in a, if I get in a landed the helicopter and the engine's off and I hold W, look how long it takes for me to get in the sky. That was what, maybe two seconds? Right. You can skip the launch sequence of every air vehicle as long as you immediately swap seats before you do. Okay? So look how fast I get in the sky now. It's instant. And you can, yeah, you can do this in the attack heli too. So if I'm if I'm gunning, okay, as an example, say you're flying solo in the attack heli, and you swap seats and you start gunning, you swap back to your main seat, takes a couple of seconds, yeah? And then you fly up again. If you swap twice, it will skip the sequence. So let's replicate that again. And I, I'm back again. So, you can skip the launch sequence by swapping seats. If you, What you can do... Now, this only works on sort of noobish pilots. A good pilot, you cannot do this on, okay? And pretty much, it's effectively stealing their helicopter. And the way you do it is you force them to turn. And by the time they've turned, you shoot them out from the side. So, I'll show you how I do it in one of my montages. Okay? Take a look. Alright, so... I'll just slow it down a little bit. I see the heli, he's got a little bird and I'm using the Z11, I want his heli, because I like the AH-6 better, it's smaller, easier to, f to fly with, it's just a better helicopter, okay? So I spotted him, I, flew, I, I fly close to him, as close as I can, alright? I realise he's not a very good pilot, so I can take advantage of this. So what I did here, kept moving to dodge, and I flew underneath him, okay? By doing that, like, this was just lucky, I road killed one of his passengers. But by flying underneath him, he has to turn. And by turning, I then shoot him out from the side. Like that. Okay? And then in turn, I shoot out the rest of his passengers, and I take their heli. Okay? If you master this, very, very powerful. Uh, uh, Zero, yeah, that, that's just pretty much baiting your target. Falls on the same category. I'm not going to go into an extreme depth with every little thing, but pretty much using your own momentum, you can bait people to commit to you, and you can take just, just what I did then. It's you can take advantage of that. You can bait people to push into you, so then you can use that to your advantage.